when you do films, they're so, uh, you know, sandcastles, you know, it's like a thing you do and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the next time you kind of get reacquainted with it is when you're looping a year later or eight months later. So it's not like the theater where you see the same lines and everything gets into your blood. Movies are something where I'm more likely to remember what car I was driving to the studio then than I am the details of shooting the film. It's such a, like a mist. It comes and goes so quickly it's over. Beetlejuice. The thing I remember most is Michael. I mean, Michael came and Keaton knew the secret. Because I would act, and then I'd have some doubts. And I'd say, well, maybe I this, maybe I that. I was much more neurotic about what I would do when I was very young, starting off in films. And Keaton just came out, he was like the comedy Annie Oakley. He was like, whoa! <laughs> the mirror. <laughs> you know, he just was so self-assured. He was so just tore it up. And we were doing a scene, it's in the movie, where he spits the loogie into his jacket, which he completely improvised. He's like, hey, what do you believe like that? Hey, whatever. And he's saying his lines. He goes, I'll save that one for later. And he said the line, save that one for later. And I thought I was going to choke. I was laughing so hard off camera. I'm really going to have to get to know you guys. You know, we got to get closer. Move in with you for a while. Get to be real pals. You know what I'm saying? And... <laughs> Save that guy uh, for later. Huh? My wife and I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure, sure, sure. sure, sure. Go ahead, shoot. Well, well, for instance, uh, what are your qualifications? Ah, well, I attended Juilliard. Keaton amazed me. And we did the movie with Tim, who would sit at a desk when we were at the old Culver Studios, and Tim would draw the characters, he would draw things, I mean, he's an illustrator, he's an artist, and he would draw, and he would never look up at me. And I would say, you know, Tim, everybody else is there has got a thing they're doing, and I know you want the dead people to be the most colorless people, then the really frightening people are the living people. You want the ghosts to be the most banal, or whatever his language was. And I said, uh, I, I think I need to come up with something where I'm like, Robert Cummings, I wanna, I wanna, if you know Robert Cummings, the old actor, uh, he's a very posh, kind of elegantly spoken man. I just had a hook into it, you know, my wife and I are, we don't have any children and I collect antiques and I wanted to be sort of a guy who talked like this and I was gonna do this whole kind of campy thing. And Tim is looking down at a piece of paper and maybe this is the only direction Tim gave me the entire movie. He would look up and go, no, don't do that and go back down to the paper and draw. You know, you know, when you do those movies with people who are those visualists like Tim, you just trust them. You know, you're doing the movie and they say, we're gonna give you the old age makeup and Gina and I had the very, uh, you know, kind of skull-like construct they put on us. You know, they put the straws up your nose so you can breathe and they put the casts on you and they do all the life casts and everything. It's a, it was the first time I think I'd experienced that. You know, you never mind that when you're in the hands of somebody who's as gifted as Tim. I've done, not a lot, but I've done a couple of films where we did that and I was like, why don't we just cut the scene? You know what I mean? I'm like, we just don't need this. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did Beetlejuice, I had no idea what it was about. I thought maybe all of our careers are gonna end with the release of this film. We're all gonna be dead. But um, when you were around Tim, he was just such a, kind of a crazy professor, you know, his, uh, when we did that scene in the, and, and Char Boy was there, and uh, he offers me a cigarette. He's like, cigarette? I forget the lines, he's like, cigarette? And I say, no, no, I, I've, uh, I don't smoke. You want a cigarette? Oh, no, thank you. I'm trying to cut down myself. And the guy's <laughs> And we were like, we couldn't handle it. You know, we just was like cracking up all the time. That's one of the earliest movies I made and, and you, you see everything that's involved in making movies brought to bear on a movie like that. I was in a uh, recording studio. I was in a building that was very uh, important. I, was, I directed a movie, the only time I directed a movie that I took my name off of because the investors in the film committed bank fraud and one, maybe two of them, went to prison for bank fraud. We wound up calling the FBI. It was in the summertime of 2001. 
and I would come outside and I would smoke a cigarette, I'd like to get some air, we were in the dark room editing, and we were next door to this fire station and I would kibitz with these guys and talk to the very nice guys. All of them were killed in 9-11, not all. And Anderson comes to this building where I'm editing and he says, uh, he says, I'm probably not going to use this, but they're kind of insisting that I have a narration track. And I'm not going to use it. I mean, it's really just, it just isn't really important. And if, if you don't mind, I'm just asking as a favor, would you record this track? And we would do it. And he goes, just don't put anything on it. Just, just say it. Just don't do anything. I'm like, okay. So we just flattened it out and flattened it out and made it more kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, basic. Royal had lived in the Lindbergh Palace Hotel for 22 years. Can you pay her in cash? He was a prominent litigator until the mid-80s when he was disbarred and briefly imprisoned. And he was like, thanks, and uh, really very kind of you, and, uh, you know, we're probably not going to use it. And then they used it, and uh, you now it's my favorite Wes Anderson movie uh, because of Hackman, because of all people, Wes Anderson, who I don't, you know, I don't compare Wes Anderson to, like, John Frankenheimer or John Ford, or Coppola, mm -hmm. you know, some commanding, kind of almost swashbuckling director. Uh, Anderson is a very kind of quiet, humble, shy guy when I met him. And he's the one that got Hackman to sit on these bad impulses he had in the latter part of his career, mm -hmm. where he immunized himself against all of the events and all of the kind of uh, uh, conditions of the character he was playing by playing amusement. Hackman got to the point where he was almost laughing right before he delivered every line. You see, the missiles are coming, Captain. He'd be like, okay, the missiles are coming? Like, he really didn't play the stakes. And Anderson got him to play the stakes in Royal Ten and Love, to really care and invest and, and flatten out that and, and, and comb out that kind of silliness. Where's the doctor? No, 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 just wait a second now. Wait a second. Okay, uh, listen, I'm not dying. But I need some time. A month or so, okay? I want us, I want us to, to... to What's wrong with you? Damn. Ethel! Are you crazy? Ethel, baby, I am dying. Wes got him to do that, and I thought, my God, this is the greatest performance that Hackman's given, and Hackman made a lot of movies. He said, this is the greatest performance he's given in like 10 or 15 years. I had no interest really in doing a TV series because I thought I'm going to be parked here. I was divorced from my ex-wife. My daughter was very young. It was around 2006. I said to Lorne, I can't do it because I need to be able to commute back and forth to L.A. every other weekend. I mean, I would never compare myself to this great actor, but it's like they talk about Brando in On the Waterfront, and he said, I got to go to my therapist in Queens every Thursday, whatever it is, or two days a week. I was kind of like, I said, I'll do the pilot. Then they said, uh, do 12 episodes. I said, I'll do six. And I was very intimidated because they were all funny and I'm not. And even throughout the first season, I was terrified of them. I was terrified of Tina and Robert and Reggie. And, because the, cause the, the smartest thing I would ever say was no, not funnier than the dumbest thing they ever said. And the, my best idea was weaker than their worst idea. And we did the show. I remember sitting there with a cup of coffee in my hand. And I was sitting there going, this isn't so bad. I mean, this is very, this is kind of interesting. And it's, God knows it's funny. They're very funny writers. Years and years of market research, which led to my greatest triumph. A trivection oven. Oh, my wife wants one of those. Could we get Pete an oven, please? Hey. The GE trivection oven cooks perfect food five times faster than a conventional oven because it uses three kinds of heat. Thermal technology for consistent temperature, GE precise air convection technology for optimal air circulation, and microwave technology for incredible speed. With three kinds of heat, you can cook a turkey in 22 minutes. And we worked out some things the first season about the character. I thought the character should be, um, he should be good and bad at, what, at his job. Mm. You know, he should be great at his job. And they've misapplied him in the entertainment world. He's widgetized entertainment, which is always a catastrophe in my mind. And so we went and did it. And after the first season, we all started to get our footing, like many shows. If you watch the first season of Will and Grace, none of them sound the way they sound right. after season three and four. By the time we got to season two, it was really... 
just a toboggan ride. It was really, the writing was so funny. We won this award and that award. Season three and four was bombs away. We won every award. Yeah. When the show ended, and I had to do the scene in the boat harbor down by Battery Park and say goodbye to Tina and say the, uh, tell her in my, in my god awful way that I loved her. It's a word that comes to us by way of the old high German luba from the Latin lubere, meaning to be pleasing. So I'm going to use this word to describe how I feel about you in the way that our Anglo Saxon forefathers would have used it in reference to, say, uh, a hot bowl of bear meat or your enemy's skull split. I love you too, Jack. I, I cried. You know, it was really very hard because in season five, we all realized that season five was the weakest writing wise, mm -hmm. and the following season six was the end. So in season five, I was saying, I'm gonna do six and I'm out of here, I'm done. Like we've hit the wall and we're done. We come back and season six is as good as anything else we've done. It's a, it's, a, it's a dip and we come back, and when we come back for season six, I say, I'll do nine or 10, let's sign for three or four more years because I really love the people, I love the job. I thought I was kind of getting to know what I was doing comedy-wise. I was always had my doubts about that. And then Tina had her second child, her daughter Penelope, and I was convinced it was going to end like, you know, just Tina just couldn't do that kind of work anymore because she and Carla were there morning, noon, and night writing. And uh, um, I, I kind of sensed that, you know, Tina must be exhausted. She's a mom and everything, so... Um, she decided to do a shorter season seven and then it was over. And, uh, you know, Tina's smart about probably everything. I was gonna say nearly everything, but probably everything. And it was probably a good time to go. We all run into each other and we're all like, and there's other shows like this, where they all look at each other and say, we're never gonna have it this good again. I'll never have it that good again. That watch costs more than your car. I made $970,000 last year. How much you make? You see, pal, that's who I am, and you're nothing. Nice guy? I don't give a shit. Good father? Fuck you. Go home and play with your kids. My agent at the time, Michael Bloom, who's since passed away, he was my dear friend. He was my agent for 11 years. He was very smart, and he said that Pacino had been in and out of the role of Ricky Roma a few times. Pacino was always got a, kind of a buyer's remorse sometimes in terms of film. I don't know how true that is, but he went to the producers of the film and said, if, if Al balks again and doesn't do the film, would you let Alec play Ricky Roma? And they were like, yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, that's a great idea, yeah. And what we were led to believe was he did walk away again. And they did offer me the part of Ricky Roma. And then, you know, all hell broke loose, and then all of a sudden everybody gets, you know, realigned, and we're back in place, and Al's going to play Ricky Roma, and they said to me, would you play Blake? And I, and I get Mammon on the phone. And I said to Mammon, uh, you know, what I find interesting is that you won the Pulitzer Prize for the play. Uh, why did you feel the need to rewrite the Pulitzer Prize, prize winning play? And he said, you know, Mehmet talks like this, he's very kind of... Uh... He said, these men are gonna commit a crime and they're not criminals, they don't have a criminal nature and I need to put the vice on them and really kind of squeeze them a little hard to become criminals. Because you are the deus, deus ex machina to come in and put that pressure on them to do something. He said, I always felt that was a flaw in the story. I thought, well, you fooled the Pulitzer people, but uh, he, um, he said, I always thought that was a flaw in the story that we needed. So he writes this monologue. And I come in and I rehearse that summer, I believe. And it was hard to lay into those guys. Here I am with all these people. I mean, Ed and Kevin and Pacino wasn't in the scene. And uh, uh, Jonathan Price wasn't in the scene. But Lemon, mm. who I had worshipped, I worshipped him, and there he is. I'm being presumptuous here, but Lemon did a thing with me where he, like, kind of encouraged me to stay where I was with him. Don't warm me up. Don't talk to me. Don't. Let's all stay in this ugly place. A-I-D-A. -A. Get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? 
A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you gonna take it? Are you man enough to take it? And when we were done, he was very kind to me and said, uh, you know, he, he paid me uh, you know, a really nice compliment when we left. And it was tough, you know, it was the rehearsal. I didn't know the lines, so I improvised. I think I th said things in the rehearsal that were 10 times worse oh, wow. than what we, I was like, you know, you know, I said, I think I said to Lemon one day, I go, you know, blah, 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 your balls. Remember when you had a pair of balls, old man? I would say like these really reductive things. And, and Lemon was like, stared at me, you know. And I just marvel at uh, uh, what a great job Foley did, Jamie Foley, and um, and Juan Ruiz and Chia was the DP. One of those great monastic DPs who hardly spoke to you. They did a great job. It's really, I think it's a great movie. Hunt for Red October. When I got on the plane, it was back when you had a first class cabin, a business class cabin, and the coach cabin. And if there were 12 seats in first class and 12 seats in business class, of the 24 people in that plane, half of them had a Tom Clancy novel in their hands or reading it on the plane. Cardinal of the Kremlin, Red Storm Rising, Hunt for Red October, whatever. Hardcover, paperback. And I remember getting on the plane as I came into the front of the cabin, I looked down and I went, all of them are reading a book about a character that I'm going to play in the first movie about that. And it just became so intimidating to me. And then of course, though I get there and Number one shows up, and he goes and has his his hairpiece fit on and his wardrobe. But he comes in one day into the set, and I thought, I'm so fucked. Oh. I said, No one's ever going to even see me or look at me in this movie. He comes in, and he said, uh, Do you go to the rushes, boy? I said, I was like, What? And he said, Do you attend the rushes of the film? And I said, What's that? He said, The dailies. The projection or whatever he explains and I go and I knew what it was but I was like I was so like, stricken by him and I said uh, I know he goes well how do you ever expect to learn he was so uh, in the frequency you know he knew where the camera was he knew the pace he wanted to speak I mean I wonder sometimes if being a British actor you're just get, you're just born with that gift of the pace of the language like our fathers and our grandfathers before us Say so we play our deadly game. And once more, we play our dangerous game. A game of chess against our old adversary, the American Navy. He's giving that lecture to them, and as the camera's moving around and Jan is moving around him, and he's just turning this way and turning that way, it's like he's skiing down a hill. You know, he was so talented. You know, he looked the way he looked. He's so unspeakably handsome. It was so powerful, and then he talks, and you forget within five seconds that he's supposed to be Russian. Right. And he's sitting there saying, our old adversaries, the American Navy. And you go, that doesn't sound like Russian to me at all, but who cares? You know, because it's this guy's this god. And of course, everything when you're a movie star, you have an eye on, and he was wearing this beautiful leather jacket. I've never seen anything so beautiful. At that point in my life, I was quite young then, or quite, early in my career. And I said, where's that jacket from? He said, the wardrobe department made it for me, this blue saw leather jacket. I said, that's stunning. And he goes, I'll have them make one for you. <laughs> I was like, that's movie startup too. Get the boy a jacket, a blue saw leather jacket. I've had a thousand memories of him, but my greatest memory was uh, we went to a party that the producer had at his home. And a lot of people involved with the film were there. And he was there with his wife, Micheline, who's this little, tiny little fox of a woman, just a wonderful woman. And the tray would come by with the champagne, and he would go to reach for a glass of champagne, and his wife would go, no, 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 Sean, not to drink the champagne. And he would go, oh, no. And then, Five minutes later, the tray would come by with the canapes, and he'd go to reach for a little mushroom quiche, and she'd go, no, 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 Sean, not to eat the canapes. And she'd go talk to this person or that person, and Sean looked at me and goes, it's not going to be very much of a party.
Blue Jasmine. You know, I'd worked with Woody. I did the movie Alice, which was his take on Juliet of the Spirits, and I worked with him and with Mia years ago. Then he contacted me to do this small part, the, 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 the husband of uh, Kate Blanchett. And we did the movie, and Woody, I, in my opinion, Woody is very uh, church and state between drama and comedy. And although this is a funny moment, uh, I think it's indicative of how Woody likes to work, because Woody's very hermetic. He's very quiet. He doesn't talk to you. He came up to her in a scene we were doing, and it's a scene that was cut from the film in which I'm uh, kind of gaslighting her, and I'm saying, well, you know, you need to go see your doctor again, um, get back on that medication, because she's suspicious of my behavior, which she has every right to be. And we're doing the scene, and he says, why don't you, uh, you know, add uh, that, add a line where you say, you know, perhaps you should go back to, you know, that doctor that you're seeing, uh, get your prescription, doctor, you know, come up with some name of the, the doctor, and he's there with his head, like, looking down, like, this, the, the doctor, and I go, uh, Dr. Fetterman, and he went, nothing funny. Nothing funny. And I was like, you know, I was like, in comedy, we go for the funny. And here, we don't go for the funny. They saw you having lunch with her, taking her hand. Oh, what crap? Who told you that? I know who. It was that vacuous troublemaker, Lydia, am I right? Were you? It had to be Lydia, because I was having a business lunch with Amy at the Four Seasons. Did and you was there. take her hand? Are you nuts? You think if I was having an affair, I'd be crazy enough to have it in public at the Four Seasons? Well, I don't know. Sometimes you drink at lunch. No, maybe you're all high. I mean, it's obvious she's got a crush on you. Kate Blanchett is one of the most gifted actresses alive today, so she knew full well what she would get herself into in a dramatic role, regardless of the script or the director. He really wrung her out. He'd say to her, I, I need you to really be coming apart. You are at your wit's end here. And uh, she'd go do it again. She'd down an espresso. She'd smoke a cigarette. Action! She'd come in, and she'd try to beat the living daylights out of him. We had this physical altercation. And it got in more and more intense. And after like nine or 10, I don't even remember, like 11 takes or 12 takes, he was like, okay. But you know, the first five or six takes, the poor woman, he was like, I, I, I gotta tell you, you know, you, you're just not, you, you're not there. You, you've gotta be, you, you're at the end of your rope. And she go, <sighs> boom. And she'd go in there and, you know, show you what great actors, male or female, do, which they just dig down. So she was great. Mission Impossible. This, sir, this is the trap. We are being directed. Hunt! Sir, there are still two plutonium cores in the wind. And you lost them! So you get a phone call from somebody, calls your agent, they say they want you to come do Mission Impossible. And for some reason, Macquarie, Cruise, Mission, that whole gang, you just sit there and go, yes, sir. You know, you're on, what time is my plane? What time is my flight, sir? You go there and it's just, you're in the zone with them and because there's nobody who's more, you know, and in a warm way, not in any menacing or, or kind of unattractive way, Cruise every day is like, hi yeah, You know, he's like ready to go. You go to work and it's like, he is, he comes to work the days he's not shooting, he watches you guys shoot, him and Macquarie have some notes, he runs to the gym, he goes to the editing room, he goes to the set to look at the set they're gonna be shooting on next month. He's producing the film and doing and doing and doing. And then you get on the set and he's made so many movies. I mean, how many movies has Tom Cruise made? Big movies. And he sit there and go, this isn't working for me. And him and Macquarie go and they sit at a table and they do some little dialogue polish. He's not afraid to use the power that he has and the authority that he has on behalf of making it right. I've worked with movie stars who come to work and when the scene isn't working it's because they're hung over. And they go in their trailer and they take a nap for an hour and then they come back and maybe they're like ready for another round. Cruz never rests. He's like a shark. He shoots. And we, what's that line that uh, uh, Richard, Richard, Richard Travis says? They eat, they swim, and they make little sharks. And that's Cruz. He just is so dedicated. He's so intense. And it's intoxicating. I love working with him. I love him. Making those movies is always fun. 